to it. First, we have to start in France because France is crazy town right now. <laughs> that's that's the only way to put it. And Kosher says, what's happening or happening now in France? The far left are violently rioting. When they lost the first round of elections last week, they resorted to public violence. Now that they won, they're resorting to public violence. I'm pretty sure we know who the extremists are. <laughs> yes. Peter Sweden says, exit polls show that the socialists, communists are set to win the French election with Marie Le Pen and her right-wing party coming in third. Third. Yeah, third. Pretty crazy stuff. And Wokeness says 9.3 million people voted for Marie Le Pen's party, RN, today. 5.1 million people voted for NFP, the Communist Socialist Party, today. The people of France wanted a right-wing government to put France first. Instead, they're getting the opposite. How does that happen? How does that happen? So this is the will of the people being turned on its head by political games. Here's another one. Killian, I think, says Marie Le Pen, National rally party won every single French department except for Paris in the EU election. Every single department. That's like Trump winning every single state except DC. And I'm supposed to believe they came third in the parliamentary elections? No way. No way. So was it rigged? What happened, right? Wall Street Silver says Macron's party and the radical left teamed up to, to, to strategically withdraw candidates in certain races so that they could defeat Marine Le Pen's party candidates. The French are turning into an Islamic caliphate. More crime, more rapes, more millions more fake refugees. France has lost. So how did, it, how did they do that, right? How did they turn the will of the people and a majority vote, a strong majority vote, right, into a loss for Le Pen and all of the people who voted for her? Uh, here is some green text that is talking about that. This is from 4chan or, um, yeah, 4chan. And it says, there are 577 seats in the French parliament, the Assemblée Nationale. So 577 MPs. Each MP is elected in an electoral circumscription, electoral territory. And it's an absolute crazy system. Who favors the loser? Yes, favors the loser. Let's say there is five candidates in an electoral district. The winner gets 45% of the votes in the first round, and the other four candidates share 55%. You need 12% to qualify for the second round. Traditionally, the other candidates qualify for the second round, do not withdraw. So the winner in the second round is the, usually the winner in the first, was, is the winner that was in the first round. But if a loser withdraws, he gives his votes to the loser who have more chance to beat the winner, because the other 55% do not want the victory of the 44%. So they all so they all ally under one candidate to block the victory of the other candidate. So this is what they did here. You have 120 seats who get one like that by the far left and Macron's party because of the withdrawing alliance. So the far right who get 40% of the vote nationally got only 20% of the seats. The far left who got 30% of the vote nationally get 40% of the seats. Macron's party who get 20% of the vote got 30% of the seats. This is how they stole the elections. So it's electoral interference. It's underhanded. It's dastardly. I don't know if it's illegal. I don't know the French system that well. Wyatt, because I pointed this out because I feel like this strategy is the same strategy used against Bernier and against Nigel Farage more recently. And Wyatt disagreed that this was even a strategy. And I said, here's like another example. And he said, this is, you just don't understand how French elections work. Fair. I don't understand how French elections work, but this seems pretty clear cut to me. And it, it seems that the strategy was to undermine and block. And I mean, maybe that's part of their whole electoral thing. Maybe that's that happens every so often, right? In French elections, people get wiped out. Um, the wrong party wins. Coalitions happen. I mean, look at Justin Trudeau and, and the NDP. So maybe this is just business as usual. But I feel that in the West, each system has its own, own unique um, details, right? So to subvert the Canadian system or subvert the UK system, it's different than to subvert the Australia system, even though they're all based on the same thing. The details there are different. The, the parties are different. The number of seats are different. The details are different. And so in France, the, the system is different. It's got a two-round voting system, and they've got this lovely little block situation that they can easily utilize. Maybe that's all this is. But there are a lot of people who are very surprised by this, not just me. And I think that as we've seen all across the West, there's a very, very clear strategy to uh, flood and overwhelm the country. The Cloward Piven strategy of overwhelming the country with people that they can't serve and just gumming up all of the bureaucracy and all of the services and everything like that until the country's overwhelmed 
overwhelmed and broke and then you know out of out of chaos order right so anyway and wokeness is talking about all of this electoral stuff as well and they say this is insane macron's party colluded with the far left socialists in order to block le pen's win 200 candidates dropped out last week coalescing against the far right so it was the strategy of in the second round if they drop out their votes go to the communists Right, so they'll drop out and give the win to the communists in order to block Le Pen. So that was the strategy in play here. Um, the coup just paid off. So this guy's calling it a coup, and wokeness is calling it a coup. The coup just paid off. The socialists won first place. It, look, it looks like France will not be saved. So, I, right here they are celebrating. She is. This girl is very happy, and she's saying, uh, "We beat you. You lost." <laughs> Vous avez perdu, on est trop fort à gauche, on a l'amour, on a la fête, on a la joie, vous avez la haine, on est trop fort, on est trop fort. The left is too strong, too strong, he says. No, I, these people are bonkers, bonkers. They're, they're, they're the madness in the eyes, you can see it, right? It's almost like uh, 28 days later, right? So twitchy. Um, Mario says, French elections, final results, left-wing alliance, pop, new popular front, this is the Communist Party, 25% of the vote, 182 seats. Macron's centrist party, 24% of the vote, 168 seats. National Le Pen's national rally, 37% of the vote, 143 seats. So that's interesting, right? That's very, very interesting. And uh, BFM TV reports that French President Emmanuel Macron must now call on the leaders of the New Popular Front to hand over power to the far left extremists to form a new socialist left wing government in France. So that's pretty interesting. Here they are celebrating in. Uh, Paris, they, they've got um, Islamic flags, so that's interesting, right? They're celebrating con conquering Paris, I guess. Uh, Brendan says, I'm fascinated by France's far left. If they lose, Paris will burn. If they win, Paris will burn. Seems rational. It, it's because they hate France and they want to burn it down and take it over, and that's what they're doing. Paris update, it's 2 a.m., says Alexandra Lavoie. She's a rebel news person who's out there right now, and she says it's 2 a.m., and the police are still intervening. There has been significant vandalism and graffiti tonight. Taxpayers will bear the cost. Nobody's going to get arrested for this, right? Nobody's going to get arrested for anything like this. The incoming government's not going to do a damn thing about it, right? Ian says the far left, having won the French election, is expected to continue funding welfare programs for refugees, a policy that encourages more arrivals. This is a managed collapse. Yes. Uh, Tokyo Rosie says CTV no, has no problem calling Marie Le Pen's party far right, but a coalition of actual communists is just left wing. Last time I checked, communism was about as far left as it gets. Uh, communism has killed a lot of people, right? So this whole sanitizing of communism is very, it's very modern, avant-garde. Um, these people want to become the communists their forefathers never could dream of. They, they want it to work, right? And they think they're close. And China is making it work if you will, and that's the model for the world. And that's that's what they're trying to do. Digital prison, digital ID, uh, central bank digital currency, that's, that's communism that will last a very long time because breaking out of that is going to be very difficult. It's already difficult and they don't have the digital ID. They can just freeze your bank account though. So, you know, it's it's already difficult. We're already in a bad situation. We're already losing this game and we're well past half. You know, like if there's quarters, we're close to the end of the third quarter. I wouldn't say fourth quarter. There's still time to win this, but there's, I play hockey with my brother and some friends on Friday nights. And like, there's a point in time where you have too many goals and we start counting it out. It's like, you just have eight goals to get in the next 60 seconds. So that's like, you know, two goals per 10 second block sustained. You have to do that in order to win the game or you're not going to win the game. And that's kind of where we're at, right? Like we've got a minute, we've got to score 10 goals and we haven't scored any goals in the last hour, but now it's important that we score goals. So that's where we're at. And it is very conceivable that we're not going to score those goals. It's very conceivable that we're going to slip into a situation where very bad people have full control of everything. And the people who are trying to fix things are being demonized, vilified, and thrown in jail, gulag, or whatever you want to call it, right? And that's not great. It's not great. Killian Cillian says, Marine Le Pen, quote, I'm not disappointed by a result where we doubled our numbers of MPs in the face of a coalition of every other party. Aided by the media, which took clear sides, we are the biggest party in votes and seats. The tide is rising and our victory is only deferred. So, I mean, that's interesting. We'll see. I don't think she was talking in English, but maybe she was. Oh, no, she was not speaking in English. So, 
we'll just leave it there. But good outlook, right? If if she can make it to the next election, and if there's no more dirty tricks, and if all of the other parties don't want to align against her and exploit this obvious flaw in France's electoral system, uh, well, then she's sure assuredly going to win in 2027, right? Uncommon Sense says, why is this happening? Look no further than George Soros's Open Society Foundation. You should look into, if you've never heard about what happened, George Soros shorting the pound and like destroying the uh, buying power of that currency. And so George Soros did a lot of damage monetarily in the United Kingdom before he went worldwide. And now worldwide, uh, well, he wants to implement his Open Society. And what does that entail? Also, James Lindsay does uh, full breakdown, I think, of the book and of other George Soros writings. So if you're interested in George Soros stuff, go watch some James Lindsay stuff because he really breaks it down and makes it easy to understand what what's being talked about. Here's just a quick pass, passage of what is um, George Soros's Open Societies. Book overview. George Soros's The Crisis of Global Capitalism became an international bestseller and an instant classic. Right, A must-read for anyone concerned with complex market forces that rule our global economy and create both prosperity and instability. Now, in open society, Soros takes a new and provocative look at the arguments he made in that book, incorporating the largest global economic and political developments into his analysis. He shows how our economic and political arrangements are out of sync. Recognizing that our existing institutions are under sw the sway of sovereign states, he proposes an open society alliance with the dual purpose of fostering open societies in individual countries and laying the groundwork for a global open society. In leading up to his inspiring vision, Soros presents an iconoclastic view of the world that has guided him both in making money and spending it on his network of open society foundations. This book sums up the life's work of an exceptional individual. George Soros is the best fund manager in history, a stateless statesman, and an original thinker. So uh, that's blowing some sunshine up George Soros' way, but I'm, I'm just drawing attention to the open society and the money he spends on that, right? And open society, he spends money to fund think tanks, et cetera, that come to the conclusion that you know what the United States really needs to do, and Canada and the West really more broadly, is open borders to anybody who wants to come, even anybody who wants to destroy the country, because, you know, realistically, destroying the country would be better for the United States. What? And like, people don't even blink at the faulty reasoning or at the kind of crap science or at the, what is it, pseudoscience that they use to justify all these things. Nobody even thinks twice about it, right? Stay home, stay safe, right? Let's let's go out and clap to the sky for our heroes. It's the same kind of idea, but this is much bigger scale, right? And COVID was a huge scale lie. Woke Watch Canada says they have a five-year plan. Macron is getting to ha going to have fun. Joseph says, this sounds awesome. So what are the new communists going to do in France? It sounds a lot like what's happening in Canada, to be quite honest with you. Far left's proposed platform includes rising France's monthly minimum wage, lowering the legal retirement age from 64 to 60, building 1 million new affordable housing units in five years. Oh, housing units. Oh, man. I love, I love my housing unit. My housing unit is just such a wonderful place housing units. Goodness me. Um, 1 million over five years. Well, Canada is going to build 10 million over two years. There you go. You can't write. Have we built one? Jeepers creepers. Um, so housing units over five years, freezing the prices. This is great. Freezing the prices of basic necessities, including food, energy, and gas. The state would also pay your household costs associated with children's education, including meals at cafeterias, transportation, and extracurricular activities. Um, and I see Crap Daily says, oh, look, Venezuelan economics. This should work out well. France is going to crash the euro and, and the EU. Yeah, probably. Yep. If this, if this goes, man, I can't, ima I can't imagine this going well. There are pieces of this that I've heard me talking about talking about reducing the price of energy. But I wouldn't freeze the price of energy because I think that that's probably the incorrect way to do that. You talk to industry and say, what are your bottlenecks? What makes this so expensive? And they'll say, taxes. And first, you take away all the taxes on, on energy because taxing the first input of everything makes everything more expensive. So you do that. You remove the taxes on energy. Fair enough. And then you find out the, the bottlenecks with the goal of reaching, I say 70 cents a liter, but I think you can probably get it down to 50 cents a liter. And then you decide what can be done with an extra 20 cents a liter. And then I like, I think that, I think that hmm, maybe, I mean, 
No, I don't think you should tax energy. Um, but I, I was going to say, I think that originally it seems like a really good idea to tax that energy at a low rate, right? But as soon as you start on that slippery slope, somebody's going to be like, you know what? All we have to do is tax that energy a little bit more. <laughs> so we stopped that. You can't do that. You cannot do that. I was going to make a proposal for just a little bit of taxation on the energy, but it's such a slippery slope. You can't do that. You have to, you have to say no. Anyway, it's a bad idea. And Freezing the price of energy is a bad idea. I remember every time um, in the 90s, in the 90s, the price of gas was, it was 59 cents. It didn't break 59 cents a liter until I think I was 15 or 16 years old. I was like, really? I'm going to start driving now and I got to pay 60 cents a liter? Are you kidding me? This is going to break the bank. It's crazy. And so my dad was super mad about it because he had a long commute. And um, fundamentally, hold on, sorry. They, they had a price freeze in place because the there was some crisis, and I can't remember the details because I was too young to really be paying attention to politics. Um, but the crisis, not that it was manufactured. There's another phone call. Cheevers, cheevers. The crisis was manufactured in order to raise the prices, and the prices responded after the, the freeze by going up quite a lot very quickly. So stuff like that doesn't work. Those kind of policies of freezing prices on things, it doesn't work because it just puts pressure on the production. And then if if... It costs twenty dollars to make a loaf of bread, and the price is frozen at at a dollar, let's say, and um, you can only make X amount of bread because the money that you've got coming in only allows you to produce X amount of bread, because you can only spend a dollar, and what comes in only allows you to make so many pieces of bread. So, right, and, and it, the whole thing is a, a downward death spiral. It's a it's a spiral down to nothing working and nobody being satisfied at all. The market doesn't work. Communism doesn't work. Vivid says, this is France. If this doesn't concern you, I don't know what will. Um, these are people praying Islamic pray prayers in all sorts of different spots. Lots and lots and lots of people. Like I thought, I thought England was bad. France is bad. Holy smokeronis, right? The whole West is bad. This guy says, um, this is what's going on in France. And it's only 47 seconds. And I think he's, he's probably right. Like he's not, he's not wrong. That's for sure. Here we go. They own the entire planet. And of course they put people in place to do exactly what they did with the race war. They've got to get us all fighting each other. They've got to get us thinking this country's after that country. They hate each other. They're at war. Bullshit. The 13 families fund both sides of every war. They not only start them, they fund them. The Rothschilds have funded every, both sides of every war since the Napoleonic War. Look it up. It's not uncommon knowledge. You can find it if you look. People just don't want to know that this stuff is true because it, then the world becomes a scary place. When they realize and wake up, it's all a scam. You've been lied to about everything. Interesting. I don't know who that guy is. So uh, I just found that whole aspect of things interesting. People putting, pitting groups against each other. Why would the leaders of France import wholesale a replacement population that believes, a completely, believes in a completely different religious uh, structure? Um, and they're at odds. They fight, actually, right? Like Christians, Muslims, there's been whole stories written about like, you know, campaigns and wars and crusades and all sorts of other stuff. So like, there's a whole thing, there's a history there. Why would that, why would they do that? Huh. Real Ben says, as you watch the chaos unfold in France, remember who made it all possible. The Caligari plan is real. So these are headlines talking about um, Swiss Jews demand open uh, open doors for migrants. Over a thousand U.S. rabbis petition lawmakers to welcome refugees. British rabbis call on Cameron to admit more Syrian refugees. U.S. rabbis envy Canadian counterparts' chance to welcome refugees. British Jews come to the aid of refugees in Calais. Sorry, I got that wrong. British Jews lay groundwork for influx of Syrian refugees. Right. So it seems like a plan. Seems like there's certainly a coordinated effort to have people in power who see things the way those headlines see things and not the way th the way countries used to be run which was you know strong closed borders um, taking care of your own first so on and so forth and what does all this mean for canada of course it means well ryan garrison says these two J justin and jagme just watched what happened in france they're already pl there are already political bed buddies they are already political bed buddies and there's no doubt a plan to stay in power and it's already underway. Yeah, I, I think that's probably really true. And same thing's kind of going on in the United Kingdom, in um, England, same kind of invasion. This guy's talking about same thing. It's a different guy, but he kind of reminds me of the other guy. 
But anyway, here we go. Here's this guy talking about what's going on in the UK. You know, I really can't believe what I've just witnessed in the UK. How is it possible that you've experienced the radical Islamization of your country in just the past few years, and now you've voted for the Labour Party that's going to accelerate that pace exponentially? So let me tell you what you just voted for. You know, the Muslim population doubles in Britain every 10 years because they have children at the pace of rabbits while the birth rate of native Britons is in steep decline. That means in a matter of 20 years, you're going to have more Muslim members of parliament than Christians, which means your country's system of government will become Sharia law. So all of you bleeding heart liberals who keep voting for this madness because you just love those poor military age fighting immigrants who are flooding into your country and you just love those LGBT communities, well, guess what? When your system of government flips to Sharia, those LGBT you love so much will be completely wiped out because their mere existence is incompatible with Sharia law. And at that point, when you realize what you've done, it'll be too late because you've also voted in a party that'll spend the next 20 years softening your men or transitioning them into women so that you won't have anyone to fight for your country. And you can forget about women's rights. I don't want to even think about what's going to happen to your daughters. Now, you might, might be listening to this and think it's irrational or maybe I'm fear-mongering, but just take a look at photos from Iran in the 1960s and 70s and compare them to pictures of Iran today. You'll get, a, you'll get the idea pretty quickly. But Islam aside, you've also voted for a move towards communism. You voted for digital currency and social credit scores so that if you complain about being confined to your 15-minute cities or climate change lockdowns, the banks can simply freeze your accounts until you parrot their zombie propaganda. You have to take this vaccine or your family can't eat. So you British patriots have two choices. You can give up now and say it's over, our country is finished. I've seen a lot of that sentiment all over social media to today. Or you can rise up and take to the streets and protest like never before. Let your voices be heard. Your government works for you. Don't let them forget that. You know. Interesting. Do you think a protest would be enough? I don't. I don't. Why? Freedom convoy. Right? If you protest like that again now, you'd be thrown in prison and they'd go harder on you than they did on the original Freedom Convoy because, because the first Freedom Convoy happened and according to the government, that was terrorism, even though now we know it wasn't, right? And so they'd still respond as if it was terrorism. It's pretty wild stuff. And so I don't think a protest is enough. He's saying, you know, you just got to get out there and protest like you've never protested before. Ain't it? That ain't it. That's not the solution. I'm sorry. It's not it. That's not going to. And I mean, maybe, like may, maybe, maybe I'm really wrong. Maybe protesting is it. Maybe protesting is totally the way to do it. Can you give me an example of where they've been successful and installed their government, installed a, a patriotic government that has been able to to rule? Right. So I can't think of one either. So uh, Lee says, oh, look, a shiny new job title, mega bucks, wages, no doubt, all designed to distract you from the fact that we have no deterrent and the boats will keep coming. So the Home Office makes this announcement in the United Kingdom, new powers, new resources, border security command will be a step, a step change in how we tackle organized immigra immigration crime. So yeah, do you think they're going to tackle organized immigration crime or disrupt trafficking networks or work with European partners? I'd, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it because my goal what I want to see is the fastest pathway back to sane, rational leadership possible and not uh, human trafficking, um, children trafficking, digital IDs, central bank digital currencies, communism uh, writ, writ large in an NWO world where there is no escape. I, I don't want to see that. That's bad, right? Like that's bad. D.D. Denzler says, look at this demonic grin on this monster's face as he relishes the opportunity to finally deliver on his digital prison. Tony Blair has been plugging away a digital ID for our banking overlords for decades, and it looks like in Starmer, they finally have the tool needed to finish the job. A cashless society is a surveillance society. So here we go. I am constantly saying to my own party, Labour Party, which will probably win this election, you've got to focus on this technology revolution. It's not an afterthought. It's the single biggest thing that's happening in the world today of a real world nature that is going to change everything. Leave aside all the geopolitics and the conflicts and war and America, China, all the rest of it. This revolution is going to change everything about our society, our economy, our, the way we live, the way we interact with each other. I think we're living through a period of massive change, right? This is the biggest technological change since the industrial revolution, for sure. How do you use it to transform healthcare? Uh, education, the way government functions, how do you help 
educate the private sector as to how they can embrace AI in order to improve productivity. I mean, this is a huge agenda for a government and a really exciting one. You know, people get a bit depressed about being in politics because you get all this criticism. Uh, people certainly in the West feel society's not changing fast enough and well enough. And I say, no, it's a really exciting time to be in politics because you've got this massive revolution that you've got to, to come to terms with. I am Interesting. But digital ID, I don't think is as exciting as Mr. Blair thinks it is, right? And, you know, using it to transform education and healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Th that sounds great. But notice that when somebody says we're going to transform healthcare, you imagine I'm going to get better healthcare. And they imagine we're going to save so much money, right? And your goals are different than his goals, but he's going to transform healthcare. And transform is kind of ambiguous, right? It could mean a whole lot of things, right? And so it's ambiguous ambiguous on purpose. So you can fill in the blank for what you want it to be. And somebody else can fill in the blank for what they want it to be. I'll finally get that Crohn's something. They'll finally make whatever legal for me to, like mushrooms legal for me to whatever, right? We're, we want to drive change, right? And but it's ambiguous and you can fill in the blank and it just seems like they exploit. Hello everyone. Thanks very much for watching. This is just a short version of a longer show. If you'd like to get the whole show, you can go over to canadapoly.com and sign up for a subscription. Just look in the drop down tab for shop and donate and look for subscriptions and you'll get immediate access to the full show. Love to see you. Thanks for watching everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful.